Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the third day of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. I just got done watching uh, the speech live uh, by Nasrallah, the head or spiritual head of Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon. Hezbollah is a, it means the party of God. So they are a Islamic political party with a military wing, just like Hamas is a political party, a, a, a resistance party, means Islamic resistance, basically. Uh, and they have a, a, a political, social, and a um, military wing. In Islam, the idea of separation of church and state is basically a no-no. So uh, that is one of the impulses that has led to a lot of things in recent years uh, a lot of things that are taken for granted in the United States are simply not so. It's not so. And the idea that you can have a, a separation of religion and government is a, actually a pretty absurd idea uh, in some ways. Um, uh, you, you, you can't separate God from government. You can separate a particular denomination, which is what the Constitution says, there shall be no establishment of religion. That means there shall be no particular denomination that shall be the official church, like the Church of England. That's what that was referring to. It wasn't saying that Christianity has no rule in, role in government. That's absurd. Atheism has no foundation for anything. You know, what, what uh, atheism has no ability uh, logically, rationally, to say one thing is good and another thing is bad. It simply has no foundation, which is the truth of the Enlightenment. They were basically, well, if you can take um, atheism the same way, like Marxism, all these things that are atheistic, they, they, uh, they borrow meaning and morality and all kinds of ideas from Christianity or steal it, depending on your point of view. And then they speak about things that they have no right speaking about, like good and evil and justice. If there is no God, none of those things mean anything. It's just silly. It's Atheism is, the, is silly self-deception. It is willful uh, self-deception. It's impossible. If you're going to be like that, then there is no more, you, you are nothing at all. You know, there's no meaning. There's no difference between a human being and a piece of dirt uh, under atheism. No logical, rational differential is possible because you can't talk about meaning if you're simply nothing but matter and in motion, you know. <sighs> Silly. But uh, anyway, I watched N Nasrallah. I didn't hear anything. I was watching a live amateur translation by Richard Medhurst. Uh, and so there was there was an awful lot of words that didn't get translated. But uh, I think he was trying to get the, the gist of the message apart. And I think live translation is, well, well especially for somebody that is not, uh, doesn't do it all the time as a professional, is a very difficult thing to do. Listening and speaking, it's, it's a very... It's difficult enough to even talk with somebody translating you and try to pace yourself so they don't get too much or too little. But, uh, yeah, I think th th there was nothing particularly uh, startling in the message. Uh, he, what he said was that Nasrallah has been with the people of Gaza since the 8th, which is the day after the 7th, of course, uh, and they've been doing s some assistance in the north, uh, distracting the Israelis a bit. There, there hasn't, they haven't come full in, and that's what I was wondering about. Was he going to announce that uh, Hezbollah was going full in on this thing? Apparently, it, it's going to be more like a cycle of ex escalation uh, in the north. But he was calling on others to join, too. And I just posted a, a video 
actually calling on that. I, in fact, I just saw a, a post by, was it the foreign minister of Israel, basically saying, if you're not with us, you're against us. If you don't condemn Hamas, uh, you're against Israel. Okay. Uh, Israel is worthy of far more condemnation than Hamas, especially after some of the facts. I just saw, who was it that posted that? Who was it that posted? I've got a Let's see if I can bring it up here. I have been saying, I don't know how much, a lot of the videos I do don't actually get posted. So, or I'll do a video twice, maybe three times before I post it. And I, some, sometimes I think I said something. I said something, I just didn't, might not have posted it. Uh, so I want to see if I, if I got it on this computer. I don't have necessarily all the, sites. Oh, I don't see it here. Anyway, there was another common speaker, um, I think he's former CIA, that was posting uh, his, his latest posting was, he's come to the same conclusion I have, that, that what happened on the 7th uh, has been greatly exaggerated on the Israel side. Uh, not as many casualties, apparently, as they claimed. And as I also concluded, that maybe half of those casualties were actually inflicted by friendly fire. And there was very little evidence of widespread, deliberate killing of civilians. Haaretz newspaper uh, in Israel has posted a partial listing of the victims of the 7th, and of the posted ones, approximately half of them are actually uniformed, uh, uniformed um, Israelis, either police or, or uh, military. And the other ones, oh, most of the other ones that were listed there seem to have died at um, the music, so-called music festival. The pagan festival that was very close to the uh, edge of Gaza, which wasn't announced, the lo location wasn't announced in advance. So uh, uh, Hezbollah or Hamas would not have known that that was there. They struck at mostly military sites around the perimeter of Gaza and overran them, uh, proving the Israeli military is not entirely competent. <laughs> Oh, yeah, they panic. I, I know in Vietnam, too, and in other places, when the enemy overruns your, 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 your base, you go crazy. You, get, you, just, you just panic. You don't know what to do. And that's what happened to the military in Israel that morning. So they were calling in air support. And, and as I concluded, a, uh, AH-64 uh, Apache helicopters and tanks— and there's a lot of evidence out there. And in fact, Israel has foolishly posted pictures of a, auto, a vehicle graveyard where they have piled or dumped all the burned out vehicles uh, from some of these uh, kibbutzim, which are a, a, kibbutz, a kibbutzim in Israeli history has had two purposes. One is agricultural, the other is like a military outpost. They were, uh, kibbutzes were not completely civilian, <laughs> going all the way back to the initial settling in Israel. They were they were they were armed. They were armed. Uh, they had they had a, a militia or a self defense force or whatever. So, uh, yeah. See, so we look at these things from an American point of view, and we don't understand. Unless you can understand if you want to do a little research and you're interested in the truth. But uh, I didn't see anything revolutionary in, in Nasrallah's speech. Uh, the only thing that I, I didn't hear that was a little bit surprising was they, I thought, and everybody was, I think, anticipating that he was going to say they were all in. But uh, not yet, at least... Uh, they're going to continue what they're doing and probably ramp up the pressure. 
Israel has to stop this immediately. There is nothing uh, else that can be done. Or the local nations, the countries around them has to stop. They have to step up and take some responsibility for what's going on. The video I just posted, I, I compared an example that, uh, that if your neighbor is being raped or beaten to death, and you have the ability, and you, you're an eyewitness to this, and you have the ability to intervene, you have a moral duty before God to intervene. Love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, their life should be as important to you as your life. Now, the, the person that doesn't have the rights in that circumstance is the one committing an act of violence because they're not doing what they're supposed to. They are guilty, and in those cases would be guilty under God's law of uh, a death penalty, uh, assuming you actually beat, a, beat somebody to death. But definitely, for example, rape would be uh, a death penalty offense. If you see that, and you, and you just pass by in ignorance or deliberate ignorance, blind yourself to it, then you bear some of the responsibility for allowing people to do such things. But I'd like to look at uh, God's Word a little bit. There's things in the Word of God that you don't find in the Quran, nor in the Talmud, unfortunately. And we're talking about the Old Testament here. I'm talking about the Law of Moses, which supposedly the Christians and the Jews and the uh, Muslims all recognize as a revelation of God, even if they don't read it. So let's go to... There, there's some principles in this that are really the foundation for what we call human rights today. In the United States, for the uh, the Bill of Rights, there are principles that are in God's Word that He revealed 3,500 years ago through Moses. So here we'll start at Ezekiel chapter 18. Now this is a prophet that God sent um, during the period of Israel's captivity or Judea, Judah's captivity in Babylon. He was actually uh, in Babylon as a captive. So here in starting at verse 20, this is what is written. And this is God speaking here. And the soul who sins shall die. Now, there's a whole context above this about uh, Israel, and they have a proverb that the, the, the fathers have eaten sour gra grapes and it sets the son's teeth on edge. In other words, they, they had a, a, a doctrine that uh, the son is guilty of the sins of the father, or the father is guilty of the sins of the son. And that is similar to what we're experiencing in the United States and other areas today with this idea of... Uh, of wokeism, where you have collective guilt or generational guilt. And the Constitution absolutely forbids that, the, like blood liable, libel and things like that is um, absolutely prohibited by the, the United States Constitution, but nobody reads that document at all. So. But this is God's Word, which is much more important than the Constitution of the United States. But the principles here are the foundation for a lot of things that we regard as fundamental human rights. Principles of justice. The soul who sins shall die. The individual who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteous, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. If a wicked man turns from his sins, which he has committed, keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. In other words, if you repent, God will forgive, forgive you. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness that he has done, he shall live. In other words, he has turned from wickedness to righteousness and because he has repented and begun to follow God, God forgives him. 
Then God says this, do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Says the Lord God, the Lord Jehovah, the Lord Yahweh, Elohim Yahweh. And that he should turn, uh, and not that he should turn from his ways and live. So God is not looking to execute judgment. He would prefer you repent and receive forgiveness. God has no pleasure in executing judgment, in executing death. That is not God's desire. It's not God's purpose. But he is just and will if you refuse to repent. Or if you were righteous and depart from that and turn to wickedness, well, none of your previous righteousness are going to, to apply. So you, where you are... So what you did in the past isn't even the issue. It is the current thing. Are you following God or are you following wickedness? All right, so that's a principle there that you the, the, the sin is upon the one who does it. The idea of, a, of punishing others for the sins of an individual, uh, punishing people that didn't commit the sin themselves, you know, that's collective punishment. That's one example. Uh, collective punishment is one example of violating this principle. The person that commits the evil is the one who is guilty. They're the ones who did it, not somebody else, and not another generation. They're not responsible for their sins of their ancestors. They're not responsible. People today aren't responsible for their great-great-grandparents being slave owner, owners or anything like that. That is ridiculous. That is totally contrary to God's purposes and God's will. They didn't do the sin, so they're not guilty. And uh, that's the kind of garbage we have to deal with tonight, today in the United States. Uh, they want to codify injustice. And this is kind of injustice that's being taught in the American universities today. All right, so let's look at another scripture. Just a couple more short ones that are really the same. This is Exodus, so this is the law of Moses, Exodus chapter 12, verse 40, uh, 49. So this is while they're in the wilderness traveling from Egypt to uh, Canaan, Palestine, what came to be known, named by the, the Romans as Palestine uh, after they finally had to remove the— uh, after the Jews launched a second war of rebellion— <laughs> in what was it like 135 AD or CE for all you people that aren't Christians. Why do you think it's called, why is it 135 CE, not AD? Because some people just don't like Jesus Christ. That's why. Anno Domini, AD, Anno Domini. It's Latin. It means year of our Lord. Just like the Muslim calendars based on, what, the Ma uh, uh, Muhammad's pilgrimage from uh, Mecca to Mo Medina or something like that, wasn't it? Sorry for my ignorance, but your calendar's dated on that. And the Jewish calendar's dated on who knows what, because their chronology's all screwed up. They've got a missing 500 years or something in there. Okay, Exodus 12, 49, one law, one law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. See, you see that one law for the Jews and for the non-Jews in, the, in their midst, among God's people, in God's land, among the community, one law for both. No special rights for the Jews or the aliens. Same, one law, one law, equal justice for all. Here is Exodus 23, 9. Also, you shall not oppress the stranger. This would be like an alien. And you know, we talk about illegal aliens in the United States. Aliens because they're, they come from outside. They're not, uh, they're not Americans. 
foreigners. You shall not oppress the foreigner. For you knew the, know the heart of a, a stranger, a foreigner, because you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. So God prohibits them from not treating the foreigners in their midst uh, equally. You shall not oppress them. In fact, you're supposed to treat them as your neighbors. In other words, you're supposed to love them as your neighbors because God commands you to love your neighbor as yourself. And the stranger dwelling in your midst peacefully, it, God says you must regard them as your neighbors. Not one law for the Jews, not one law for somebody else. One law for everyone. Equal justice under the law. All right, so that's uh, what I wanted to mention there. Uh, all right, well, let's talk about, I want to talk about uh, again and clarify a little bit the problem we have in Israel, this, this, the nation of Israel, the Zionist project, because that's what it really is. It is the Zionist project. Now, Zionism is originally, as far as Israel, the establishment of Israel, it was a a secular ideology that came to about in the late 19th century in Europe. It is not inherently a, a part of Judaism, although there is an element, you know, it's a commonly said next year in Jerusalem. There's a longing, a certain longing that's part of uh, Jewish tradition uh, and history to return to the promised land. <sighs> you can only do that with the Messiah. But nevertheless, that is part of it. But the secularists didn't believe, the, the original uh, Jewish Zionists didn't believe in God. They didn't practice uh, Jewish tradition. They didn't practice the law of Moses. Uh, they were just secularists, and they were who knows why, why they had this ideology. Predating them, you have the Christian Zionists, which are largely a byproduct of a system of biblical interpretation known as dispensationalism, which arose in the early 19th century, uh, largely through a man named John Darby, who was actually Irish, uh, an Irish clergyman um, who left that and joined the Plymouth Brethren, at one point, he had an accident a, riding a horse, apparently. I suspect he landed on his head. They don't say. He just had a serious accident while in hospital. And this was, this, again, the same time that uh, Joseph Smith in the United States was having his revelations. Uh, three gods appeared to him, named the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three separate gods appeared to him in a vision, and, well— <clears throat> Joseph Smith is not a credible witness to anything. He had a reputation as a liar and a swindler, a scammer, a scammer. That's what he was. Uh, he was a, a, a professional treasure hunter, and he would get people to in, invest in his treasure hunting schemes. Pretty young man here. And then he would go <laughs> gullible people, and then, of course, he would fail to find the treasure. But the money was always gone. No payoffs there. So that's uh, the origin of that. And apparently the, the Book of Mormon was actually a stolen manuscript that somebody else wrote as a piece of fiction that got turned, republished as, as a divine revelation. Mormons are not monotheists. They're not Trinitarians except that they have three gods. They are something very strange. They believe that their three gods, which are one of innumerable gods, were originally human beings, men. And through something like Hinduism, I mean, you, see, you can see something cosmic evolution uh, through reincarnation, but not that that these, these, these certain men, certain people are able uh, 
through whatever, living a good life, able to become gods. That's Mormonism. They don't tell you that when they come to your doors, do they? No, you've got to be indoctrinated. You, they don't tell you the secrets of Mormonism until you're deep into it, where they know they have the hook set deep. Otherwise, you'll spit the hook out and leave. Fishing analogy there. But uh, what I wanted to mention is that the Zionism, the ideology of Zionism, by its very nature, is unjust. It is not one law for all. It is, it is special rights for the Jewish people. It is a special claim. The idea that you can go to somebody else's land and that's been on it, been on that land for about two millennia and lay claim to it because you're perhaps ancestors. There's been a whole lot of racial mixing. Just look at the Ashkenazi, the European white Jews versus the, the, the local Jews and then the Ethiopian Jews. And all, we're all pure, uh, pure. We're all of one, you know. We're all descendants of Abraham. Well, I don't think Abraham looked like some of those. Although you do see uh, David, for example, was, there's some indication he was uh, red-haired, which meant there is genetic diversity in us. Uh, the, that's the way it is. So certainly among Israel, that's, that's not uh, unusual. Uh, just among Arabs, you see a considerable variation, too. Adam, all our DNA comes from Adam. All of it. No matter who you are, we all come from one man. And then, th then through a uh, Abraham from another man. <laughs> so that God built the potential for lots of variation into his creatures. Deliberately. God likes variety. He, he's not doesn't like he's not into monotones. Okay, so uh, anyway, the the very nature now at, when this arose in the late nineteenth century, there was a whole lot of nationalism coming to to the fore, in reaction to to all the Im, Im, empires that existed. Everybody, all the ethnic groups that had been uh, suppressed. And their heritage suppressed under these empires. You had the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Spanish Empire and the British Empire. And, the, and uh, well, Germany didn't have an empire. They, they were a collection of states until uh, Bismarck united that. But then they began to spread, too. But you had all these throughout history, the Romans, uh, the, before them the Greeks, and before them... Uh, what, the, uh, the Persians and the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Egyptians. And then after Rome, you, of course, in the Islamic world, you had the, a whole series of empires, of caliphates, last of which was the Ottoman uh, out of Turkey, or Turkey, Turkey, Turkey. I want to get to the, try to learn the correct pronunciation on that. But, uh, yeah, so which... Uh, Erdogan of, Tur of Turkey, I'm I, I just going to give up on it maybe, um, is, would like to rebuild the Ottoman Empire or just some of it, perhaps, return to a, uh, well, he's semi-Islamic, I'd say. But Islam, of course, recognizes this, and I recognize it too. You cannot build a civilization on sand. Rome, the reason uh, Constantine uh, supposedly became a Christian, which I seriously doubt, was that he wanted some glue to hold the empire together because Rome had no glue other than the legions, other than their military. They had no power. And that's what the United States is now. It's nothing but Rome. It has no, no glue, no glue anymore. Uh, there is no, uh, there's, we have people from all over the world people that speak all kinds of languages, all kinds of different heritage. There is no glue, especially since the political ideas, the political principles uh, of the Constitution have been destroyed by the government and society. 
especially the government. Principles of liber, uh, liberty, limited government and equal justice under law, those principles, freedom of speech, all those things are, are being destroyed systematically in the society by numerous forces. So what holds the United States together? Military, love of money, corporate power. I mean, there's, there's, it's, it's, it's disintegrating. America is dis disintegrating before our eyes. There's nothing to really hold it together. There is no Christian consensus in the United States anymore. Christianity is in free fall. It still constitutes a majority of the people who identify themselves as Christians, but as far as people that actually are seriously Christian, well, 5% maybe? Maybe 10? Most, most, uh, and there's a difference between biblical Christians and or the majority of Christians. Like Roman, Catholic, uh, Roman Catholicism is the largest den denomination in the United States. And the majority of Roman Catholics do not attend Mass. They don't go to church. Maybe once or twice a year. So that's not, that, that's not somebody that takes their religion seriously. I mean, you could be a Roman Catholic, but take Christ seriously by not going to Mass. Uh, but that's a different thing. There are, there's a lot of Christians in this country that, that aren't a member of a congregation because of the problems with American Christianity. They simply don't. They, they, perhaps they read the Bible. Perhaps they know God and just realize that uh, that's not quite the real thing there. But there is not... Uh, Christians don't have a real inf uh, uh, influence in the United States. Christian morality, Christian doctrine, the teachings of Jesus don't have an influence in the United States. No. Uh, which is one of the things about Islam that is admirable. Muslim nations tend to take their faith much more seriously than Americans. Americans that have any, and again, the, the biggest group in the United States, or not the biggest group currently, but the most rapid growing group in the United States is those with no religion at all. The United States is in free fall. It is doomed because it has forgotten God. As the scripture says, the nation that forgets God shall be turned aside to destruction. Every nation that forgets God shall be turned aside into destruction because it doesn't have a foundation. It's inevitable. God doesn't have to, God simply is not present, so there's no life. There's only death. But Zionism, this ideology of Zionism, again, it arose in a time of nationalism across the world. Uh, you know, people are alert, uh, desiring to express their, their historic identity. In the United States, you have all these immigrants, too, and you'll, you'll see these, um, they're not exactly ghettos, but... Uh, probably less now than there used to be. Uh, usually the newer in, uh, immigrants form communities where they can uh, speak their native language. Uh, they're in a very strange land, a strange place, so they, they tend to huddle, huddle together. And that's normal. That's natural. Uh, and then their children graduate out of that. But the uh, different ethnic groups they still want to hold on to some of their identity because how can you live without any identity at all? My identity is Jesus Christ, not my Scandinavian and German ancestry. I don't even recognize the German side. It's like a quarter. But uh, no, that's not my, my identity is not there anymore. When I, when I became a Christian, that all got... I don't need that. What does that have to do with Jesus Christ? Nothing at all. Ethnicity has nothing to do with Christ. He's my identity, and he's my future. Right there. My eternal future. And I know God. I know him. So, Muslims, you can know God. 
in Christ, but in no other way. In the Messiah, you can know him. Jews, you can actually know God personally, have a personal, eternal relationship that begins now, not after you die. So here we have uh, the, the Zionism as an ideology is inherently contrary even to the law of Moses because it is not equal justice for all. It is not the idea that has been largely universally accepted that all people have human rights, that we are all human beings and we all need to be treated as equal human beings. No special rights for one group as opposed to another. You could say the, the British system of royalty and the commons is contrary to. It is. It's, it's not. Uh, it's unjust. Special privileges for people based on their birth uh, is not right. Special purposes, especially under law, where you're treated differently under law. In the law of Moses and in other places in the, in the scriptures, it talks about you shall not show preference to the poor in a, in a legal dispute. Uh, the poor over the rich or to the rich over the poor, but you shall seek justice alone. The truth, not showing preference to either side. In the New Testament, that's condemned in the book of James, too, about showing preference to a wealthy man that comes into your, your church, into your assembly, uh, as opposed to how you treat a poor man that comes into your assembly. It's very clear that that, that is sinful, that is, you, you do that with wicked desires, because the rich man might give you donations, and he, the poor man might ask you for help. So he's like, eh. Uh, see, God knows our hearts, and he demands that we treat all people the same as far as justice goes. And Jesus, who goes far beyond any other human being that ever lived, and he is more than a human being, says that we are to love our enemies because God does. God even takes care of his enemies. God, unlike a certain nation, even feeds his enemies. He provides them with, with rain and a harvest and all kinds of good things to enjoy, even though they hate him and despise him and worship idols. He still takes care of them, still provides them when he could simply do what Israel does to people. So... Israel is not following God, the, the state of Israel. Again, there are many Jewish people that utterly reject the Zionist ideology. Uh, they, they do not accept many of these ideas. And you need, the Jewish people in particular, need to raise their voice more, some are doing it, more against what Israel, uh, the, the nation state that calls himself Israel, is doing. They can't really ignore you. They can't simply dismiss you. Israel can't just say to them, if you're not with us, you're against us because you are them. But we have to realize, and people need to think about this, is Zionism an acceptable ideology in this world today? Because there's lots of ideologies that are in this world but they're not acceptable. We don't want people to be under the authority of all kinds of ideas because they are not just and they are not helpful. They don't bring life, they bring death. Uh, all kinds of evil things in this world. And governments in particular, we don't want to be uh, in, uh, forced into subservience to wicked, evil systems that are not just God-ordained government for the purpose of punishing the wicked and rewarding good. And governments are become an abomination when they pervert justice. And that's very clear in the scriptures too. When uh, the, the government perverts justice, that's an abomination in the sight of God. 
and we have that going on right now. What what uh, what the Zionist project is doing in Gaza is an abomination in the sight of God, and if man doesn't bring justice, God will, and God's justice will be absolutely terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. Israel's already experienced judgment from God multiple times in the past, including from the misbehavior of rulers. Even King David brought terrible judge, judgment on Israel because of his own pride and refusal to listen to what God said. I brought a plague on the land, and I don't know how many tens of thousands died because of David's sin. And it wasn't about Beersheba. It wasn't about Sheba. It wasn't, it wasn't his adultery. It was taking a census of the people to see how many fighting men he had. And God in the law had forbidden him to do that, forbidden the kings of Israel to do those things. So he ignored God's word, did what he thought it was he wanted to do, and brought death on his own nation. So that's, uh, governments can, can bring something other than justice upon their people. And Zionism is inherently unjust because it doesn't treat all people as equal, inherently in violation of God's own law in the Old Testament because it doesn't treat the foreigner or the stranger, the non-Jew, in the same way it treats Jews. Jews do not have special rights in the sight of God. God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't treat anybody differently than others. All who trust him in him are welcome to him. He welcomes all those who put their trust and faith in him. And that's what he requires, faith, trust. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him or accounted to him or uh, he was regarded as righteous in the sight of God, not because of his good deeds, but because he believed God's promises. He believed God. Zionism has no place in this world any more than any other uh, racist ideology, skinhead ideology, Ku Klux Klan ideology, uh, uh, black Muslim, uh, uh, any color supremacy ideology. There's so many of these things, the, not only the Germans, but the Japanese and the Italians, all this had an ideology that was inherently unjust. They were God's chosen people. They were his special people with special rights. Well, that is always unjust because God is not like that. All human beings come from one source, from one man, Adam. We are all children of Adam. And when we think we're special, more special than others, we get more rights than others, then only evil comes of that. And that's why Zionism must not be a foundation for government in particular. If ethnic groups want to continue to celebrate their ethnic ethnicity and their festivals and everything else, that's fine. God likes diversity and colors anyway. That's not a problem. But it's when you start thinking you're better than other people, that your ethnicity is better than somebody else's. We should be able to enjoy Italians and Arabs and all kinds of cultures, the colors of all kinds of cultures, realizing they, they, we all come from originally from God. And Adam was regarded as the son of God. God created him. And in the community of Christians, those who believe in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who is called the second Adam, who is this, literally the son of God, quite literally in a way, but I don't think Muslims understand what that is. I don't think most Christians have any idea what that means. They just repeat the words without even trying to understand them. But uh, there is, he's calling out people from every nation, tribe, and tongue to himself. He's inviting people from every 
ethnicity to come to him because he is the fulfillment of what God created you to be. You'll find the fulfillment of God's purpose of making man in his own image in Christ. You won't find it in Zionism or in other toxic ideologies. And it's an ideology. And Christian Zionism is, is just a distorted heresy that predates Jewish Zionism. You need to repent of that. This is not God's will.